In the early 1920s, very few people had a manufactured radio and they were often homemade sets constructed from designs printed in radio magazines. Between the bright emitters and what would be seen as modern vowels were the early dull emitters, such as the COSA W1 in 1924, which had a 1.8-volt filament, which was the endpoint for a 2-volt accumulator. There was sometimes a choice of vowel filament voltage of 2, 4, or 6 volts in very early sets, but it settled down to 2 volts as the standard. An accumulator was rather like a large square-shaped glass bottle with a handle on the top for carrying it. Most people owned two accumulators, so while one was in use, the other was on charge at the local garage, cycle shop, or radio dealer. On average, an accumulator had to be charged every week. Some people built their own lead-acid HT or high-tension batteries, a common construction of which consisted of a few dozen glass test tubes, which were cast upright in a box filled with melted bitumen or paraffin wax. Strips of lead bent into an inverted U-shape formed the positive electrode of one cell and the negative of the next. The test tubes were then filled with ordinary battery acid. Quite a palaver, but the cost was minimal, a pint of battery acid some small offcuts of roofing lead, and a few dozen test tubes. Lord William Douglas Weir chaired a committee that proposed the development of the Central Electricity Board, which would connect the most efficient power stations in Britain. His conclusions led to the Electricity Supply Act 1926, and the links would be established with a national gridiron. The national grid at 240 volts AC had not been agreed until then, and DC voltage was still commonplace. South End at that time had 230 volts DC, and during the late 1920s and early 1930s, domestic electrical devices, mainly radio receivers, began to switch from battery power to mains AC electricity. Following his tuition at South End Technical College, Eric Kirkham Cole joined his father's small business, Henry Cole Electrical Contractor, which mainly involved wiring houses, as electricity was being introduced to domestic properties, and in 1920, the business name was changed as Henry Cole and Son Electrical Engineers. But Eric wanted to expand on his own ideas, and in 1922, he set himself up as Eric Cole Electrical Engineer. He later started his own business with his then-girlfriend Muriel Bradshaw, as the E.K. Cole Receiver Company trading from a workshop converted from a shed behind his parents' house at No. 2 Bedell Avenue, Westcliff-on-Sea. His main business was repairing electrical appliances including the rudimentary radio sets of the day, but he also made his own two-valve receivers, complete with batteries and headphones, which he sold locally on a small scale, and in line with many other outlets, he offered a service charging accumulators. In 1924, one of his customers, William Stretfield Verrills, who was a schoolteacher, and at the time recovering after having a lung removed due to tuberculosis, was particularly exasperated by his accumulator letting him down in the middle of an interesting program, and complained to Eric that as an electrician, he should be able to make his wireless work from the lighting mains. Eric replied that 230 volts was too powerful to run a 6-volt set, and apart from the danger of fire, the reception would be drowned by interference. Nevertheless, later that evening in his workshop, Eric thought about Verrill's comments and rigged up a series of lamps between the set and the mains, which reduced the voltage to the required 6 volts, and while the set worked, the hum was awful. Eric persevered and improved the apparatus, selling a few to his friends locally. When later, he succeeded in incorporating a device which also supplied the high-tension current, hitherto needing a HT battery, Verrills persuaded him to advertise it in the radio journals. While it was still crude, and not in accordance with the regulations of the Institute of Electrical Engineers covering mains devices, there was a rapid rise in sales, with the result that Verrills, in spite of his illness, went into partnership with Eric Cole in 1925 and would later use Eric Cole's initials as a trademark, becoming the EK Company, 
or Echo for short. Now that he had a viable business, Eric, at 24 years of age, took the opportunity to marry his girlfriend Muriel Bradshaw. Verrills became the chairman and managing director, with Eric Cole becoming the works and technical director, which was the role that Verrills felt allowed Eric to remain very much an ideas man, with the freedom to develop the business, while he oversaw the commercial activity of the company. This also gave him a new lease of life to the point that he almost forgot about his illness, and much to his surprise, he discovered he had a keen commercial sense, and in fact took charge of commercial policy, and was soon engaging in sales and employing publicity staff. The Echo business name was adopted in 1926 when E.K. Cole Limited was formally incorporated and floated on the stock exchange with a working capital of £2,500. The business moved to larger premises at 505 London Road and shortly afterwards moved again to 513 London Road Westcliff on Sea. The Model 1525 HT unit became the only unit for use on 200 to 250 volt direct current, while models K12, K18, K25, AC12, AC18, AC25, and TC1 were manufactured for use on alternating current only, and supplied them with detailed instruction booklets on how to set them up, their limits of use, and their charging periods etc. However, Eric had foreseen that as mains-powered radio sets came onto the market following the adoption of the national grid, eliminator sales would fade out, so production was turned over to making mains-powered radio sets, which had two- and three-valve sets, without speakers, and using the new indirectly heated valves. In 1927, a factory was built behind 803 to 805 London Road Leon C to accommodate the business, which was expanding rapidly, and employed as many as a hundred employees on contracts of varying working hours.